pretty smooth, and then you're not spending too much time getting stuck in traps as you, as you go down the bullet funnel. So what's the simplest possible approximation that we can make? Well, the approximation is that the funnel is actually perfectly smooth, and there's no energetic roughness at all. So this is called the structure-based model, where as you get closer to the native state, you only go down in energy. And then uh, any complications are caused by sort of uh, entropic non-cancellations, I guess, in free energies. Uh, I told you that we have two structures, okay, fine. So what do we do? We have a structure-based model for the pre-fusion structure. We have a structure-based model for the post-fusion structure. And so we're just going to sort of haphazardly slap these two perfectly well things together and make one giant Hamiltonian um, and see if it works. So how do we actually set a simulation? We, we start off a whole bunch of these trajectories. We did a thousand of them, uh, actually more, but a thousand at this particular temperature. And we start them out in pre-fusion configuration under the assumption of this is our Hamiltonian, and we let it run until it hopefully hits the post-fusion state. When it hits the post-fusion state, we cut off the simulation because uh, biologically at that point, the membranes are already fused and you're done. It doesn't matter, you're already simple. So at that point, we just cut off the simulation. Um, so here in the top right is the, the landscape that we get from doing all these simulations. And I just sort of wanted to point out that Okay, so I say we have these two funnels that comprise the Hamiltonian. What happens if you only have one or the other? That little, that little blown up plot I have in the top left of that, that uh, A sub I, I call it, is that's if you only have the pre-fusion structure funneled in, you get that little blip on the landscape, and then you get a similar little circle around uh, facing H if you only have the post-fusion funnel. So all the sort of rich dynamics of what's going on in the middle is based on the fact that we put these two things together. So I guess this is, this is time for some picture of science, I'm just going to start at the bottom left and walk up to the top right, and I'm going to show you guys uh, how, what these intermediates on this landscape look like. So the first thing that happens that we think is kind of interesting is there's this huge disorder transition in this sort of uh, red to green interface. I don't know, going back just real quick, so you guys, okay. So it's right in the middle of the molecule, and there's this huge disorder transition that happens right at the beginning where the green interface cracks. And it's, it's not that you might say, okay, well, it's just refolding into the, into the final structure, but it's actually not true. You can look at various order metrics, like if you want to say how order of the hydrals, how order of the angles, and it turns out that it's just becoming completely disordered. It's actually unfolding in that region. And the reason this is interesting is because uh, if you look at where these fusion peptides sit, they sit exactly in that pocket, like right in the interface between the green and the red. So we think that this cracking, that this disordered transition is actually very important for releasing the fusion peptides from the initial conformation molecule. And you know, the idea here is if you stabilize this pocket, if you have some, some little peptide that goes and stabilizes the pocket, fusion peptides can never come out, and then people you know, don't get sick because the fusion peptides are really crucial for this molecule function. So that was, uh, that was one thing that we thought was sort of interesting. Um, the next thing, there's this big intermediate in the middle of the landscape E, and this is sort of marked by uh, three-fold symmetry breaking, I guess I would call it, where the molecule kinks over on its side. And the reason that this is kind of interesting is because uh, I'm just orienting the molecule here with respect to the virus membrane. You can sort of imagine that the cell membrane is, is up on top of the screen somewhere. And so the reason that this is weird is, uh, remember that I said that the fusion peptides are attached to the yellow. So this kinking is actually bringing super hydrophobic peptides close to the viral membrane. And it seems plausible, we don't know this to love experimental to check this out, but it seems plausible that the fusion peptides are actually going to embed in the viral membrane because they're just trying to get out of water. So if you bring them close to a lipid bilayer, we think that they're just going to sink into a bilayer. So that's, uh, that's a little weird. But then the other guy is, is free to go. So we think you can get these kind of weird configurations where you have fusion peptides in both the viral membrane and the cell membrane, and whether or not that's, whether or not they fuse, whether or not they actually happen. We don't know if you love some of these terms, but it's, uh, it's interesting that this happens. Okay, so from this setup, uh, there's two main routes that you can take to complete the pathway. Uh, you can either go to the right and up, or up and to the right, and I'm just going to show real quick what the structures look like, what's going on with the routes. Uh, we call this, this is going up and to the right, so basically at first and then over. We call this the sequential route because the three yellow guys come together in their final trimeric structure before the orange part breaks. Um, and then the other route is what we call the cooperative route, where the orange part blows apart, and then it sort of just cooperative reactions wrap everything up all at the same time. So as soon as the orange part blows, uh, whole reaction just finishes the So um, after that, it doesn't matter which way you go, you end up with the final structure of HJ. So the transition is done. 
And the reason that I've drawn it like this, uh, so it turns out that experimentally they know if you incubate HA in low pH for too long, uh, it becomes fusion inactive, but no one really understands why this is the case. If you leave it alone for too long with low pH, and you don't give a cell for it to fuse with, then it's permanently inactive. That, uh, that influence will never be able to use that thing. And so, from the perspective of our model, what we think is happening is, is this. Basically, what's happening is the transition is actually working. It's going through. The AJs do the conformational transition. It's just that they flip upside down, and they pin their own fusion peptides to the virus. And this is sort of a prediction that comes out of this, this dual funnel model, where we think that this is a possible configuration for, for why if you incubate HA for too long at OPH, it's just an active first time. You just think that the fusion kind of all get pinned to the virus and they never have a chance to interact with those. So just um, some summary and thoughts just to go over again what happens. Okay, so you start out with three fusion HA, there's some cracking event which releases the fusion peptides, they are floating around in space looking for some kind of membrane to go into. And from here we think that if there is no host membrane, okay, then eventually the transition just flips the molecule on its head and it's dead forever. Or if it does find some kind of a host, we think that uh, there's two different routes for this transition line. And why might that be important? Well, because if you design an inhibitor that only impacts one of the routes, then it, you haven't done anything because the molecule just transitions by the other route. So you really need to think about both of these when you're trying to design something that actually works against uh, influenza. And with that, I think, uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, Jose and all the people that worked with me on this work, and I'll take questions. Take questions just want to point out that basically there's a big experimental collaboration with Brian Dyer now to check all these intermediate states. So that's one of the nice things about building these models and going after. Uh, questions? When you're devising this uh, double well model, do you let the system freely jump from well to well, or do you drive the system or bias it such that one well is lower than the other in order to see the transition? Right. We don't, um, we don't explicitly bias it, but there's sort of an implicit bias, because if you look at the number of contacts in the packing, it just turns out that the post-fusion structure has way, way more contacts, and it's packed much, much better. So there's sort of this implicit drive to that structure because it's packed so much better. Very nice. So, are you saying with these two pathways, there's some sort of like critical bifurcation point there where it goes up or across, or how do you conceive of the two pathways to the final configuration? Um, yeah. So, sort of the decision making. I, I would say what decides pretty much any decision making that goes on uh, in this whole transition really is when the orange part breaks apart. When that interface breaks, is the decision maker. That's what defines. Uh, yeah, that's what defines it all. So that's so pretty much one point is where the orange breaks apart. Okay, so orange breaks. Uh, if you go to the right from E, that means orange is breaking. So that's yeah. But you might be able to go up a little bit first before you should go to the right. So this is multiple. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, we have time for one more question. Why they replace the computers? Thank you. Uh, do you have any idea about the kinetics, the time kinetics uh, of these transitions? Uh, so uh, in these sort of simplified structure-based models, it's really hard to equate the simulation times with real experimental times. We have sort of a floppy kind of factor of 10,000 argument that just seems to work out, but it's really to think through a line with that. Yeah. Great is the first collaboration. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'd say that's very challenging. It's kind of normal. Well, you can get on factor of 10. That's a good number to get things on factor of 10. <laughs> but you don't want to bear more than that. There are other things that can create traps and stuff like that. <laughs>